Welcome to BrainFluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Today's guest has written a book I know will appeal to just about everyone in the BrainFluence audience. Nancy Harhut is the co-founder and chief creative officer of HBT Marketing. She and her team have won over 200 international and national awards for marketing effectiveness. She's worked with big brands like Nationwide, GM Card, and H&R Block. Nancy's new book is Using Behavioral Science in Marketing, Drive Customer Action and Loyalty by Prompting Instinctive Responses. And here's a disclaimer, I wrote a testimonial for the book, so like most humans, I may be biased. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Thank you so much, Roger. Happy to be here. Well, Nancy, you've worked in this space for quite a while. Are you seeing more acceptance of the use of behavioral science in marketing? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I am. You know, we're seeing our client base grow, which is, you know, kind of a one example of, of uh, more and more people getting into it. But I'm also seeing, you know, large companies create C-level positions like chief behavioral science officer, things like that, or, you know, SVP of behavioral science. And so I think that's a, a real indication that uh, more and more companies are beginning to embrace the field and, and realize just how powerful it, and how effective it can be uh, to do so. Do you still encounter skeptics? I'm thinking particularly on the B2B side, people have always considered consumers to be somewhat irrational, but uh, are there still skeptics out there? You know, I think I think there are, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, when you're trying to explain this and you say, hey, look, you know, people rely on decision-making shortcuts, they're a decision default, you can prompt them or trigger them, you know, you just really need to, you know, embrace behavioral science. We can often get the B2C uh, clients there a little bit faster because it seems to kind of make sense. But when you start to talk about it in B2B, you know, a lot of clients are thinking, I don't know, you know, my my uh, customers are very educated. They're, uh, you know, they're serious about what they do. There's, you know, uh, it's all about the facts. It's all about the speeds and feeds. It's, you know, it, it's, it's all about just the, you know, the rational sell and some of this fluffy stuff that you're calling behavioral science really doesn't fit. But the truth is, it, it does. You know, I, I worked on a piece for a campaign, actually, for um, a company that did business intelligence software. And that's pretty darn serious, right? It's high tech, it's complicated, it's expensive. And basically, what it does is it allows um, companies to get a 365 degree view of their data. Data is very often siloed. And this allowed the data to kind of bubble up and uh, people could could see all of it. But the campaign we did didn't really talk about what the product did, and it didn't even talk about you know why it might be useful. What it did instead is it talked about the the target market, you know, the, the person who would really be able to benefit from this. So you've got you know a C level executive, they're making these decisions all the time, very important decisions, decisions that not only impact whether or not they stay employed, but whether or not uh, other people in the company stay employed, whether or not the company itself is profitable, maybe whether or not the company runs afoul of certain uh, regulations. And so they're making these decisions. And, and if they know that they're making them without a complete view of data, uh, they know it's just a matter of time before they're going to get it wrong. And so as a result, that leads to sleepless nights, that leads to agita. And so we, we rolled out a campaign and we led with, with that feeling. We said it was the, um, you know, uh, you know, bubble wrap for, uh, for, you know, difficult decisions or the, the decaf for difficult decisions or, uh, you know, the, um, the antacid for difficult decisions. But we, we talked about what it was like, you know, for people in the target market to be able to use the product. And uh, as a result, it did really, really well. In fact, it increased purchase intent by double digits. So, of course, we talked about the product and what it did, but we led with a, a more emotional, more behavioral science influenced um, uh, kind of approach. Yeah, I suppose if you run into a skeptic, Nancy, you could uh, use those same techniques and instead of trying to show them the data why behavioral science works, you could bring up issues of promotion and job security and so on in a subtle way to, uh, <laughs> to get them moving in the right direction. So, well, the other thing I find uh, helps is, you know, a lot of times uh, agency people will get up and they'll do their presentation and you know, the client is sitting there thinking, does this person, you know, really want to be here or would they rather be writing the great American novel? Would they really rather be painting something that's going to hang in a museum? And when, you know, we get up and we present a, uh, a campaign and we say, listen, here's why we're doing what we're doing. And here's the research that supports it. And, you know, here's a study that came out of Stanford and here's a study that came out of Harvard. And, you know, this is what they found. It actually uh, increases our credibility with our clients. And I think it makes our clients feel a little bit more comfortable that they're getting, you know, 
work that's designed to work and not uh, work that uh, is being put in front of them because somebody thinks it's creative or somebody's favorite color is red or, you know, uh, somebody really liked the, the turn of phrase that they wrote. So, uh, so I think, um, you know, being able to point to what behavioral scientists have found in, in the market uh, really kind of adds credibility to us as marketers. And so our clients, as a result, are a little bit more willing to, uh, to listen to what we have to say and feel a little bit more confident when they're rolling out our campaigns. Right. Well, I'm sure the only advertising awards that you're looking to win are the Effie Awards, which are for uh, effectiveness, not necessarily for art, artistic quality or uh, being fun to watch or anything else. So uh, that's great. You know, you cover a lot of territory in this book, and some of it will be familiar to our listeners, things like social proof and scarcity. Uh, and uh, I don't really have time to get into those, but there are a few that uh, I know I was a little bit less familiar with, and uh, perhaps uh, so to some of our audience. Uh, can you explain what autonomy bias is, Nancy, and how marketers can use that? Yeah, so autonomy bias is really interesting. It's this deep-seated desire for humans to have some kind of um, control over themselves or their environments. And, and uh, this is really innate. We, you know, Every person feels they want some kind of control over themselves, over, over the things around them. They, they don't like to be told what they have to do. They don't, be forced into, uh, they don't like to be forced into situations. And so when we can, um, when we can give people choices, that's a really good thing. When marketers can give people choices, it's a good thing because a choice makes you feel like you have some kind of control. So um, offering people choices can be really smart. If you put one thing in front of someone and you say, uh, you know, do you want it or do you not want it? People are like, well, I don't know. I have nothing to compare it to. I have no context. So uh, maybe I'll think about it. Maybe I'll do some research. Maybe I'll ask around. And you know what happens? People get busy. Life intervenes. They, they don't get around to doing the research. They don't get around to asking around. But if you put two or three choices in front of someone, then the question goes from do I or do I not want this thing to which of these things do I want? And people are uh, almost four times as likely to make a buying decision in the moment. And uh, that was uh, that was uh, research that was conducted and uh, they, they literally found that people are much more likely to make a buying decision if you've got choices. So choices feed into this desire for, for autonomy and uh, so marketers should use them. That said, you don't want to go hogwad with choices. You want to have so many choices that people are, you know, uh, kind of dealing with analysis paralysis, you know, they have choice overload, they don't know what decision to make. But mm -hmm. giving people a few choices makes them feel like they have some kind of control and control is a deep seated desire for, for people. So it's a good thing for marketers to, to know about. Right. And I, that reminds me a little bit of the, but you are free thing, which if you're going to give somebody, uh, if you like somebody to sign on the dotted line, uh, even the choice, but you're free not to sign can be something that will enhance um, your conversion rate, your percentage of yeses. But uh, I think the choice thing, too, it's kind of an interesting topic. I just talked to, to Matt Dixon the other day, who uh, I've loved his work on customer effort, and he has a new book out. I'm not sure if it's uh, even uh, in bookstores yet, uh, but I got an advanced copy, and it's uh, called The Jolt Effect, and it's about customer indecision. And uh, some of the work in there, and I've seen this uh, work cited elsewhere, too, or similar work, uh, shows that uh, sometimes giving customers choices can be uh, a reason to delay uh, for them to uh, ponder it or not make a decision. And part of the solution for that is to guide their choice. You know, like uh, Amazon gives you a million choices and you'd think that everybody would just be stuck in choice paralysis forever there because there's so many options, but they do guide you. You know, they've got uh, Amazon's choice for something. They've got uh, sometimes bestseller flags. They've got uh, ratings and reviews. All of these are tools that help you sort of narrow down the field. And in a, in a more personal sales situation, it might be as simple as saying, yeah, you've got uh, A, B, or C. And what I've found in my experience in this field is that customers like you most often succeed with choice A. So you're giving them those options, but at the same time, giving them a direction to go in. So, it's, but it's a fascinating thing. And clearly letting people know that uh, you aren't trying to pressure them into doing X uh, is uh, the way to go. Yeah, so, well, and I like the uh, way, you know, you, you added some social proof in there too. It's like, okay, you have these choices, but people like you have chosen this. And that gives people a, you know, a sense that, okay, they're not going to make the wrong move. So you're kind of guiding their choices. You're informing them with a little bit of social proof, but you're still making, making them feel like they're the ones who are in charge. So uh, yeah, that can be very effective. Yeah, it must be instinctive on my part. I just threw that in there. Uh, you know, it's uh, so imbued probably in uh, b both of our approaches to things uh, for so many years. Another topic is 
temporal discounting and uh, temporal bookmarking. Can you explain uh, what that is, Nancy? Yeah. So or they're uh, actually two temporal- separate topics, but uh, they're they're both temporal. So. Yes, exactly. Well, they're, they're, they're almost two sides of the coin when it comes to, to timing. So there's uh, temporal landmarks and there's temporal discounting. And um, so temporal landmarks is this idea that uh, um, we, we start new chapters in our lives. And when we do that, we kind of close the chapter on who we used to be. And we, you know, we start this new, this new chapter. And when we start this new chapter, we feel like we're a new person, that any of our, our failings, any of our mistakes, those are in the past. But now, uh, you know, we're somebody new, we're starting fresh, and we can accomplish anything. So it's a great time to uh, try to get someone to commit to something, to make a purchase, because they're feeling like they can do anything. You know, maybe you're, uh, you're trying to convince them to buy exercise equipment and you know Roger whoever says I'm gonna start my exercise plan on Wednesday no one does right they start on Monday right like because Monday is a temporal uh, landmark right it's uh, the beginning of, of the week or of course the you know the granddaddy of them all is of course the you know New Year's Day resolutions the beginning of the year but it could be um, it could be your birthday it could be um, the anniversary of a, a major event um, it could be, uh, you know, tax day, whatever. But there are these days when, you know, people feel like, okay, that was the old me. This is the new me. I'm ready to, to take on the world now. So that's uh, temporal landmarks. And it's all about getting people to, to think about the old, the old them is gone. The new them is, is important. Temporal discounting is almost the other side of the coin. What behavioral scientists have found is we have a tendency to prefer uh, sooner, albeit smaller, rewards to later, albeit larger rewards. So uh, put differently, we're more likely to take $10 today versus $15 tomorrow. Although tomorrow we go, oh, I should have, you know, I should have had out for the 15, but it's that present focus bias. It's that, that need for immediate gratification. So what this means for marketers who sell things that perhaps don't offer immediate gratification is we need to overcome that, right? Uh, because if, if people want that immediate gratification and we're selling something like, um, insurance or saving for retirement or uh, education where the payoff is is distant, if at all, um, it, it's really hard to convince someone, hey, you need to act now. So what we need to do is we need to overcome uh, temporal discounting. And the way to overcome it is to make you feel that the person you are today is the same person you're going to be three months down the road, three years down the road, 10 years down the road. It's getting you to see yourself as you are today with the same preferences and, and dreams and hopes, seeing that person as you are today, but imagining that person in the future. And that's what helps you kind of overcome this idea of temporal uh, discounting. So uh, Merrill Lynch did something really interesting. I wasn't involved in the campaign, but they had this age progression software. So they wanted to sell people about retirement funds. They let people upload a picture of themselves and, and age progress at 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. And what they found was over a million people actually used the application and 60% of them said, yeah, give me some more information about saving for retirement. It made it really salient. It made it like something that they suddenly very much cared about. Whereas in the past, it was something that was way, you know, way off in the future, something that they could always put off and perhaps deal with later. So timing and how it relates to people and how marketers deal with timing is really crucial. Yeah, I tried that tool. I did not request information, but I did try it and the result wasn't pretty. So it does, uh, uh, it's, it does evoke an emotion though. So uh, that's great. Have you tried it, Nancy? I did try it and the result was not pretty. You're absolutely right about that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but you know, you, you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's me. And you know, 30, 40, 50 years, it does make an impact. Yeah. It makes you want to sign up for advanced nursing home care or something when you see that photo. Uh, Nancy, another, another topic you devote a, a chapter to is information gap theory. What, what is that? So uh, that's a, it's a term that was coined by a neuroeconomist named George Lowenstein. And uh, what he found was if there's a, a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you'll take action to close the gap. If there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you'll take action to close the gap. And of course, we're in marketing, right? So we always want people to take action. That's, you know, kind of the core of what we do. So if we can tee up a gap in someone's information, they're much more likely to you know, take the action to to close that gap, to find out. So a great way to do this is to use words like who, what, where, when, why, how, because when you pose these questions, people, they lean in. They're like, oh, I, I don't know. Who is that? Or what is that? Or why is that? And they want to find out. Um, we did some work for a, um, a company that was selling a very sophisticated financial product. And, uh, you know, how do you, how do you even talk about some of these, you know, um, 
you know, very sophisticated products, fixed annuities. Like, how do you even begin to explain to someone what a fixed annuity is? And uh, so we, we teed it up by saying, um, you know, how can you earn better rates than a CD, but still protect your money for retirement? And that was like, oh, okay. You know, it was a frame of reference people understood. You know, they're maybe saving for their retirement using CDs, but I can get a better rate, but I could still have that protection. So we used information gap theory to, to get people to kind of go, ooh, I need to find out more. And it was uh, it was very successful. It actually um, it gave them a, uh, the client an 85 um, uh, 85x on their return on investment. And if we had started out by saying, you know, why you should know about fixed annuities or what you should know about, people would have been like, ooh, you know, the eyes glaze over. They wouldn't have been interested at all. So, um, so using information gap theory is a, is a great way to, to pull people in and get them to take the action you want them to take. You know, the, the key, of course, is to frame the question in the right way. It's got to be a topic that people are interested in, they have some interest in it, but uh, they don't know everything there is to be to, to be known about it, but they're also just not so far, you know, divorced from it that they have zero interest in it. So again, saying, you know, what you should know about fixed annuities probably wouldn't have gotten them, but, you know, how you could actually uh, get better ret better returns on your money than a CD, but still protect your money, that's something that intrigued people. So so it's a, it's a interesting tactic for us in marketing. Right. So really, you're trying to get them uh, curious enough to go to the next step, not necessarily, you know, buy the product or place an order, whatever the, the ultimate goal is, but to get them to uh, open the email, to click on the link for more information, to read the article. And that just moves them down the, uh, down the chain until eventually maybe they get to the point where they're ready to actually uh, place an order, at least to maybe talk to somebody about that. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, ultimately, people, you know, want to sell product, they want to get people to sign up for their services. But before that happens, there's a series of other decisions that have to be made. You know, you have to decide to open the email, you have to decide to visit the landing page, you have to decide to, you know, talk to the salesperson, I mean, whatever it is, there are all these different decisions that have to be made. And that's the beauty of behavioral science when it comes to marketing is we can use behavioral science to help influence those decisions at every step along the way until you get to the ultimate ask, which is, sign on the dotted line. I was thinking about uh, availability bias the other day because there was a news article I was reading. They interviewed Europeans who were afraid to come to the United States after reading about uh, school shootings and such. And to me, that's a great example of how you know, something is sort of in the forefront of your mind because it's very visible and vivid, even though you know it's, it's not like uh, the streets of most American cities or the Wild West. They... It's actually very safe. And I'm not mocking Europeans because I recall a few years back when there were some uh, terrorists, very minor, relatively speaking, in terms of lives lost, terrorist incidents in Europe. Suddenly, Americans were afraid to travel there. And so I think that we all recognize that that exists when something is very vivid in people's minds, that it affects their behavior in an outsized way. But how can marketers use that in a positive way? Yeah, yeah. Um so I'm going to answer that in two ways. I'm going to tell you a personal story that I think really speaks to availability bias, and then I'll, I'll tell you how I applied it in marketing. But um, I, I spent last summer on Cape Cod, right? And uh, uh, Cape Cod was, you know, experiencing all of these shark attacks. So you'd be in the water, the lifeguard would blow the whistle, you got to come out of the water. And it was like, everyone was top of mind about the sharks. And then all of a sudden, you know, the pandemic starts. And what's everyone worried about? Well, everyone's worried about getting COVID. And that became like the most scary thing out there. So I was boogie boarding with my friends, lifeguard pulls us out of the water, we've got to stay out of the water for an hour. And we were literally impatient. We were looking at each other going, can we go back in? Do you think we can sneak back in? Do you think it's okay to get back in? And, and then we we're like, what are we, like, are we nuts? They pulled us out for a reason. There were sharks. That was like our number one fear a couple of years <laughs> right. ago. But it, it, suddenly with the pandemic, it wasn't as salient. It, you know, it was the, the, the number one fear was catching COVID and a shark. Well, it, you know, probably, it probably swam away. So it is funny about this idea of availability <laughs> bias. Like when something happens, that's what's like top of mind. So we actually ended up using it for one of our clients. We had a client, it was a B2B client, and they made um, barcoders, the kind of um, the kind of thing that would be used in like a, a fulfillment uh, warehouse where you're scanning lots and lots of packages. And what they found was uh, they had a superior product, but people who were running these kinds of um, fulfillment operations didn't want to take any risks. They knew they didn't have a perfect system, but what they knew was if it went wrong, there would be a real problem. So like, let's not, you know, let's not try to, uh, you know, fix what's not broken. It's not perfect, but it's working. And if I introduce something new, 
and it doesn't work, I'll have a bigger problem on my hands. So we had to find a way to, to reach them. And what we ended up doing is we ended up sending a direct mail piece and the direct mail piece had a compromised label on it. And we did that specifically because we knew that would resonate with people. If, if you worked in that business and you saw a compromised label, you knew what that meant. It was just a world of, of grief for you because you're trying to do all this automated scanning. And when a, uh, you know, a torn or a, a you know, a label, a skew comes through, it would hit what they would called the jackpot lane, which was their like sarcastic term for, oh, now we have to go and deal with this by hand and it's going to be a real hassle. And uh, so we sent out a package. With a, with a label that was compromised because we knew for our target, they would immediately recognize that and go, uh-oh, <laughs> like what a pain in the neck that's going to be. And um, and then, you know, we got into that and said, you know, normally this would present a real problem. However, that's not the case. You know, we actually have something that, that you should pay attention to. And it got through that, that initial barrier of, you know, we don't want to, you know, deal with anything. We don't want to upset the apple cart. We're just going to keep things the way they are um, because it got them to actually engage. And then it gave the client a chance to say, listen, we really do have a superior product and you're not going to go wrong with it. So um, they actually exceeded their goal by like 266 percent. It was it was a very successful application of uh, availability bias. Yeah, I think uh, the broader issue there, Nancy, is that the exact mental process that you described affects a lot of B2B purchases. You know, there's a high risk factor if you're changing a system, whether it's an information system, a piece of machinery in a factory, or even some process internally, whatever. You know, if, yeah, what you're doing isn't perfect, but, you know, at least it's working more or less. And if you make a change and it doesn't work out, suddenly, you know, you're the person that made the change that screwed everything up. And, you know, overcoming that by some means is so absolutely critical. Uh, Matt Dixon talked about that too, where, you know, you, somehow you've got to get past that bias for, you know, keeping the status quo in part because it's low risk. And, you know, of course, people are loss averse, which you may, that's in another chapter of the book. And that's classic uh, loss aversion. You know, if I, if I do nothing, I'll, I'll keep what I've got. If, uh, but if I screw up, then uh, boy, I'm going to be in trouble. I won't get promoted. I won't get a raise. I might get fired and so on. So, and those losses can loom large in the B2B purchaser's mind. You know, absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of work with B2C clients, with not-for-profits and with B2B clients, but uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier with, with the B2B clients, you know, a lot of times people think, ah, you know, my target is a B2B client. They're going to make their decision based on what's best for their company, right? I mean, it's a B2B environment, it's a B2B target, you know. And while this certainly is true and factors in, other things are at play. The things that you just mentioned, am I going to lose my job over this? You know, are people going to hate me because, you know, I introduced this new product or this new service and it's not working well? You know, am I not going to get home on time anymore because this is going to be more work for me? You know, these are the very human things that people talk about, that people think about, um, and they factor into B2B decisions. And as marketers, we have to be aware of that and we have to, you know, inject the right emotion and in inject, you know, the right uh, uh, reasons to overcome the barriers they may have because they may not be obvious. You know, it might not just be uh, price and availability, you know, typical for a B2B product, it could be something a little bit deeper than that. Like, you know, how is it going to affect me as a, you know, as an employee? What's my boss going to think of me? Am I going to get home to my spouse on time? So, you know, thinking about people as people, whether they're at home or at the office is really critical and weaving some of that emotion into the, uh, into the uh, marketing makes a lot of sense. People make their decisions for emotional reasons and then they justify them later for the rational ones. So I always say to clients, have both, have both in your marketing messages. Yeah, you know, automatic compliance sounds like something that all marketers would like to have on the part of their customers. And you actually have a part of the book uh, titled Automatic Compliance Triggers. Oh, what, what are those triggers and how can marketers pull them? Sure. So, well, well, one of my favorite ones is simply the word because, which I'm sure that you and maybe some of your, your listeners are familiar with, but uh, Ellen Langer at Harvard ran that study where people lined up to use a photocopier and, you know, said, hey, can I cut in front of you? 60% said yes. She repeats the study, but this time they say, hey, can I cut in front of you uh, because I'm in a hurry and I've got some copies to make? Here, 94% say yes, quite a high lift over the 60, which was the baseline. As you hear that, you think, well, they said they were in a hurry. She repeats the study, but this time the person says, hey, can I cut in front of you because I have some copies to make? Then 94 drops to 93, statistically insignificant, <laughs> right? Same high lift over the 60. And um, 
when you stop and think about it, well, everybody standing in that line was standing in that line because they had some copies to make. And uh, she identified the word because as an automatic compliance trigger. When we see it or when we hear it, we just start to, you know, nod up and down like little bobbleheads without fully processing what comes next. We just assume whatever's coming next is a, a good legitimate reason. And uh, so the word because is definitely an automatic compliance trigger. It's probably one of my favorites. Um, there's, there's another one that's more of a a visual example that I can offer up, and that is the idea of showing a, a chart or a graph. And uh, what researchers have found is a lot of times people won't really spend a lot of time pouring over the chart and graph. They won't really be studying it. Its mere presence suggests uh, scientific veracity, right? If, if the chart is there, if the graph is there, it must be true. And I don't really have to spend a lot of time looking at it or pouring over it. It's just the presence of it just increases the credibility of the, the copy, the text that's next to it. And about, I don't know, probably easily 10 years ago at this point, uh, we had done some work for a uh, major metropolitan newspaper. And uh, we were trying to get people to subscribe, which, you know, is not an easy thing to do. You know, newspaper write, uh, subscription rates are declining, but we we're trying to get people to subscribe. And we had a special offer, uh, which would give them a discount. And so we put a chart in that showed them, you know, this is what other people are paying. This is what you're paying. And it became the new control. And they have since, you know, evolved their messaging. And I no longer work with them, but I'm still on their... Uh, list and the, the one thing that doesn't change is that chart no matter what creative they're sending out there no matter what marketing message they send out the chart always seems to be there and uh you know i, I know i know why it works you know it's just one of those things where you mm -hmm. see it and you're like oh okay makes sense to me yeah i've uh, i've written about that phenomenon and it's it's so easy it doesn't cost anything to incorporate uh, another thing along the same line they found that neuroscience articles were considered uh, more believable if there were brain scans in them, even if the brain scans did not relate to the point of the article. <laughs> they were more credible uh, simply when there was uh, an fMRI brain scan in the article, which uh, has been used as a criticism of uh, overuse of these scans uh, in neuroscience articles. But, you know, if you create the impression, the unconscious impression that there's science behind whatever it is you're doing, uh, then it's it's more credible. You know, I'm curious, Nancy, when uh, you start off with a brand new project, okay, somebody says, okay, I'm trying to uh, do X here with my uh, advertising or marketing campaign. You know, there are six, well, now seven Cialdini principles. There are dozens and dozens of cognitive biases, various other tools that you could use. How do you begin? Where do you start to try and sort of narrow down the range of uh, tools that you might use? Yeah, no, that, that's actually a very good question. Um, so, you know, usually where we'll start is we'll kind of look at the, uh, the action we're asking people to take and uh, what's the number one reason why they won't do it. So, you know, a marketer wants to get their message out there. So we'll, you know, we'll look at the marketing message. We'll look at the, the product. We'll look at the desired behavior, who the target market is, you know, and then we start to think about, all right, what's the number one reason someone may not want to do this? And then we start to um, brainstorm the possible arguments or levers that would overcome that barrier. And as we're doing that, we start to also look for the appropriate behavioral science tactics that might come into play. And so there are some that are um, almost like overarching, like you'd always want to recommend them, you know, cognitive fluency, for example. People prefer things that are uh, simpler to think about and, and simpler to, uh, to understand or easier to think about, easier to understand. So, you know, you, you kind of can't go wrong by making sure that it's easy for people to absorb your message. So, you know, we're going to definitely make that one of the planks. And then, you know, we start to look at, well, all right, is it a, is it a new company perhaps that's, you know, that's uh, not that well known in the marketplace? If that's the case, we might want to introduce some of some of the authority principle, you know, uh, member of the Better, Better Business Bureau or endorsed by the ADA or, you know, or, uh, you know, is it, is it a new product and people aren't sure it's really going to work? Maybe we have some social proof, maybe we have some testimonials. Um, you know, are they, is it, a, is it a product that's maybe more established, but rolling into a, a new geography, then maybe we talk about the, you know, the number of customers they have, or the number of years they've been in business, but, uh, but basically it's, it's um, kind of zeroing in on what it is that uh, we want people to do, what are the likely reasons they're not going to want to do it, and then what are the best ways we can serve up to overcome those, those objections, and uh, the, the book has, I think, 17 chapters, and probably covers about 25 different, um, behavioral science principles, there, as you know, are so many more, uh, but, but uh, f from the experience that I've had and that, you know, the, the work that I've been doing over the years, these 25 are, you know, are 
probably a good set to start with. They're the, they're a good go to list to to work with. Uh, Nancy, this is such great info. Uh, we could go on forever, but I think if folks want more, they will just have to buy the book. Uh, where can people find you and your ideas online? Sure. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, N Harhut, N H A R H U T. Uh, you can connect with me on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Uh, I am the uh, co founder and chief creative officer of HBT Marketing. HBT actually stands for Human Behavior Triggers. So that's HBT MKTG. We short in marketing, hbtmktg.com. That's our website. We have a lot of, um, you know, information and uh, case studies and, and articles and, and um, interviews posted there. So, uh, you know, you, please connect with me, reach out to me. would love to hear from your listeners. And if anyone's interested in uh, a copy of the book, right now it's available on Amazon. It debuted at the uh, beginning of the month in the uh, number one new release uh, category for business marketing. And I just checked this morning, it was still there. So I'm very happy about that. Still in that number one position. So if anyone's interested in the book, uh, it's available on, on Amazon and also at Kogan Page, which is my uh, UK based publisher. Great. Well, we will link uh, to those places uh, on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. Nancy, thanks for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Roger, thank you so much. I've totally enjoyed all of your podcasts and I've totally enjoyed now being part of one. So thank you. Thank you.